Hello and welcome back for episode 27 of the Newbie Dentist Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Omid Azami. In today's episode, we're talking oral surgery with Dr. Ben Johnson of Pacific Northwest Oral Maxillofacial Surgery in Auburn, Washington. Ben runs at PNWOMS on Instagram and is, along with Bloody Tooth Guy, one of the original oral surgery accounts on Instagram. He is a fantastic guy and his love for oral surgery is clear if you follow his page. If we could all learn to have as much fun as Ben does, dentistry would be a much better place. In this week's episode, we talk about Ben's background and reasons for pursuing oral surgery as a specialty, how oral surgery and dental specialties in general are changing, and also get a little bit clinical and talk about wisdom teeth extractions, surgical extractions, and ways we can learn to push our boundaries clinically as general dentists while also staying safe. As always, the podcasts are available on Spotify, YouTube, NewbieDentist.com, and Apple Podcasts. If you do have any questions or feedback, I do love to hear from you guys, so please reach out to me on my Instagram account, at NewbieDentist. Without further ado, enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Newbie Dentist Podcast, the safe place for newbie dentists to connect, collaborate, learn, and grow. The Newbie Dentist Podcast aims to provide high quality and high value content for all the newbie dentists out there. With your host, Dr. Omid Azami. So I'm here with uh, Ben today, who's an oral surgeon out in uh, Auburn, Washington, and he's part of the Pacific Northwest Oral Maxillofacial Surgery Group, uh, PNW OMS on Instagram. Uh, he's been doing that for a long time, and he's you know been providing a lot of value to you know dental students and and dentists alike, uh, you know talking about oral surgery and different clinical procedures and everything like that. So, uh, Ben, what I want to start off with, if it's okay with you, is kind of just go back to your little bit of an origin story, uh, if you can like sort of. Take me back into, like, I think you're in a kind of a group practice with, like, your brothers and your dad or something, right? Yeah, so I've been exposed to dentistry and uh, the different specialties since I was younger. My dad started his residency, and when he finished up, I was 10 years old. Yeah. His brother's an or, uh, orthodontist. Nice. His other brother's an endodontist. <laughs> his other brother applied to dental schools, got accepted, but didn't do that. Man. He laid carpet for 10 years and said, I don't like this. And he applied to medical school. So now he's a family practice doctor out in Idaho. Nice. After and, 10 years. Uh, so there's a lot of um, dentistry background. Yeah. You know, so you, so you, had, uh, you had no pressure at all growing up at all. Yeah. No, yeah. no. There wasn't ever any pressure. But I, I saw, you know, the cool procedures they did. I don't flip through my, my dad's oral surgery books. Yeah. And uh, I'd look at big neck dissections and broken faces and go, that's really cool, you know. So yeah. once it came time in college, it was just kind of natural. I, I liked the sciences and yeah. uh, I just gravitated towards that. And I, uh, I would shadow dentists and I worked for my dad for several years and as a surgical uh, tech and assistant. And yeah, then, uh, yeah I just... I went into dentistry. I went into dental school, uh, maybe a little bit different than someone else, um, because I went in as with with the intent of becoming an oral surgeon. Yeah. So from day one, you know, I'm, like, I don't need to learn this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I need yeah, the grades. I mean, though. You need the grades. <laughs> I, I, I I wanted the grades, and I always uh, had the thought that if I don't get into residency because it yeah. is competitive, then I still want to make sure that I love dentistry. So I still love, you know, I follow all these, all sorts of accounts, orthodontists, general dentists, prosthodontists, endodontists. Yeah. And I just like to see how they treat things because there's correlation in everything that we do. You know, I just yeah. can't focus on, Oh, there's bone and there's not bone and there's a tooth and needs to come out. You know, gotta, you gotta look at the, the full picture. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's, that was my story. Just uh, put my nose to the, the grindstone and studied a bunch and I, I wasn't necessarily a closet gunner. I think most people knew I wanted to do uh, oral surgery and mm -hmm. I, I thought of, I thought it was uh, interesting in dental school, you know, you have this group of people who like hoard the back tests and hoard the secret stuff. And yeah. Yeah. Of course. I tried to be friends with everyone and find mm -hmm. this information that they had, you know, some pile of tests that no one else had. And you're like, Oh, I want that. And then I'd share <laughs> with everyone, you know, cause yeah. I thought that was, you know, some people who didn't want to want to specialize and they have some unfair advantage. I said, yeah. Well, no, where did you, what, uh, what else? Successful. 
so I went to Temple in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, so from the uh, West Coast, I went to a small community college in Utah, the base of the Rockies, and I went snowboarding each nice. weekend. Yeah. And it was super inexpensive. Um, and then I uh, applied to about 30 schools. I had I applied once without my bachelor's degree, mm-hmm. and I didn't get in, and I was cool with that. So I finished my degree. I applied again. I got several more interviews. Uh, I went to eight of them. I had a bunch more after the deadline of December 1st, you know, when you get accepted. And yeah. I just, I didn't have any more money. So <laughs> you know, you're, you're poor. Yeah. I had been married at that time for two or three years. Oh, I had two so you kids. got married during your undergrad. Yes. That's and cool. and uh, um, I just uh, thought, well, I liked Temple. Mm-hmm. It's on the East Coast and I don't yeah. have any more money. So I'm just going to go there. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So you, so you knew all along that you kind of wanted to get into it. So were you kind of uh, like doing research and all that kind of stuff on the side to kind of like bolster your oral surgery application for down the line or? Yeah. So I, you know, when, when you're applying to specialties, you want to be well-rounded, obviously there's the grades, there's mm-hmm. the scores, um, but you don't want a robot come into your program. So yeah. they want to see that you're a normal human being. Got some personality. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't really apply to any, research heavy schools. I did do a little bit of research in uh, dental school doing some lasers with endo teeth or I don't know, something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> no offense to any endo Means lasers. To an end. yeah. <laughs> um, no, but it was interesting work. Um, but I wasn't ever really research oriented. I'm more of a, a clinical. That's why Temple was great because yeah. you do, do research there, but it's more hands-on clinical. Um, and that's what I found when I was applying to uh, oral surgery programs was I wanted to get the hands-on yeah. nitty gritty, you know, That's clinical great, yeah. you're operating all the time. Yeah. I was in, um, yeah, yeah, I went, so I went to like, I grew up in Canada, but I went to down school in, uh, in Australia in Melbourne. And, um, like I initially, I have like an uncle who's a periodontist. So I kind of had some like, I was like, God, oh, maybe I'll do perio. And then when I started like taking teeth out, like in 30, I was like, man, like, I love this. I just want to do this all day, every day. So like, it was like a group of like, it was me and my buddy who he's actually like pursuing it now. Uh, unlike me, uh, we're like, we're going to be like oral surgery guns. So, we're like just shadowing in the oral surgery clinic and like just going to all the exo- extraction clinics and stuff. And I think it hurt me because I, I didn't do like regular dentistry like that much. Cause I just, if I see a tooth, I'm like, all right, let's just take this out. And then, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I didn't get to like do much endo or like crowns and stuff. And then now when I graduated, I didn't end up like pursuing it. Um, it's cool. Cause I like doing sort of some like minor oral surgery stuff now, but I think it definitely hurt me like in the other like, uh, aspects of dentistry. Um, so over there in Australia is pretty crazy for oral surgery. So it's like more of like the British model. So you got to like do dental school. Um, then you got to do med school, like four years of med school. And then you apply for like the residency program. So, uh, so my buddy is just, uh, he finished up dental school, did a one year uh, residency in like an oral surgery at the hospital. And then now he's like in dental school in med school. So right. Like first year med student. Now. Right. I'm like, good for you, man. Like it's crazy. I, I remember going to a conference towards the end of my residency and, um, there were some guys there from Britain and, you know, it's like, how old are you guys? And they're like almost 40. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, what rotation are you on? Cause I, I, I was a little naive to how, how it was structured yeah. there. And they said, Oh, well, we haven't really actually done any oral surgery yet. You know, I'm on my, my fourth year. I think I'm, I've been doing colorectal surgery for the yeah. past year. And I was just, my mind was blown. It's like, oh my it's goodness. So different. Like the scope. Yeah. yeah. How does that help you do a, you know, a double jaw <laughs> surgery? <Yeah. laughs> Uh, it's definitely good overkill. background in medicine though. Yeah. Good yeah. For sure. That's pretty cool. So then, uh, when you, so like, did you apply, for, did you like, uh, did, were you thinking of doing like the six year, uh, oral surgery ever, or you just kind of knew you want to, or did you just do the four year one? And no, I just applied to four year programs. Yeah. Um, kudos to those who wanted to do six years. I was offered a, a craniofacial, um, fellowship after residency, um, at, uh, Rush university in Chicago. And mm-hmm. I turned that down and you know at the end of residency I had four kids and you're ready to go my, my wife and i were done yeah yeah, yeah. chalking up that debt and <laughs> just ready to get back home and, and start, working. start working and then so when you come back um is your uh so your dad is in the same practice that he was always working at or you kind of started a new thing all together once you finished up yeah so a little bit of both um my my dad went to dental school with a guy rick edwards and and uh, they practiced in the same area for 20 years together. Mm-hmm. Well, not together, but separate in different practices. Yeah. And when I finished, I came out and those two practices merged together at the same time that I joined. So my dad had two offices. 
Dr. Edwards had one. We merged, so it was three of us, and we had three offices. And in, nice. and in anticipation of my brother finishing two more years, we purchased a, an additional office down uh, south. So now there's four of us, four <laughs> offices. Uh, we never work in the same office together, but we do rotate through all four offices. Okay, and that's pretty cool. We meet on a weekly, every other week basis, and yeah, hammer out some details. And we're always looking for you know growth opportunities and ways to change and make yeah. make the practice better. And um, so, how's it in terms of um, like do you have like hospital privileges or something like like do you ever like where do you do your orthognathic surgeries and stuff? Do you guys do that in house or you have like some sort of hospital affiliation? Yeah, I do have a hospital affiliation. Um, it's by one of our hospitals, Valley Medical Center. They're associated with University of Washington. Yeah. Um, rarely I'm there, uh, but when I have to do a surgery, a double jaw, I'll typically do that in the hospital. Yeah. Um, there's been a big push for um, outpatient based lower mandibular surgery yeah. in the in a clinic setting. So that's what we've been doing. And typically for that, we'll get an anesthesiologist to come out yeah. and do a surgery in the office. That's pretty good. And so what's like your, I'm curious, like in terms of like your, your obviously like you have your sticky notes. So we see what you're doing pretty, pretty uh, well day in, day out. Um, so it's like majority of your procedures, like just like third thirds and like implants. Is that like major bulk of your day or? Yeah. And that's, that's what you're going to typically find in a, in a normal oral yeah. surgery office is we're mm-hmm. seeing lots of wisdom teeth, extractions, bone grafts, implants, uh, pathology, um, we don't see that many big cases come through because lots of those are funneled up towards the university. Yeah. Um, and when we do find something, a lot of the time we don't have the support staff or the tertiary care that we need mm-hmm. to properly treat so those patients. Send it out. So, yeah. So I'll refer it out up to, up to UW. Okay. That's pretty cool. And so what advice do you have for like new, like for dental students who are like thinking of like specializing? Um, obviously you've been exposed to like different specialties, like through your, I guess, uncles and stuff. Um, with like the finances, like being a major issue now with like dental student, like loans and stuff, and then incurring more debt, like to specialize. Um, uh, I think oral surgery, you get some stipend like, uh, compared to the other ones though. Right. Um, yeah. do you think overall, like what's your like experience been with like, would you recommend it to students or like, uh, just like general advice in terms of like specializing or staying as a general dentist? Yeah. Uh, if you want to just look at everything monetarily, then, um, I don't know how happy you'll be in the end. Yeah. Uh, cause you know, money's good, but money isn't everything. And pretty much everyone's going to come out of school with some sort of debt. Yeah. Um, so you probably heard this from other people and you see it all over Instagram is find what you love in dentistry and then go for it. I think money follows after that. Yeah. That's um, great if, advice. If you, do, if you do crappy work, then you know, you're going to have crappy results and <laughs> yeah. your bottom line is going to suffer. It'll catch so, up with you. Yeah. Right. So that I still went into dental school knowing I wanted to do oral surgery, but I still kept an open mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tried, I tried everything and you know, room removable process wasn't for me fixed. <laughs> not really. Yeah. No, no. I just liked, I liked the, uh, the oral surgery aspect of it. So yeah, keep an open mind. You're going to go into debt and you're going to climb out of it. You know, some, some roads are a little bit longer than others, but you know, yeah. find scholarship opportunities, mm-hmm. think outside the box. Yeah. And, um, so I talked to, I talked to some like older, but like, I was a couple of girl surgeons that like in my hometown where I grew up and, um, like I, I they took out my wisdom teeth, like when I was like in high school kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I go there and just like spend a day with them and shadow with them. And they're always like complaining. It's like, Oh, the golden days are done. They used to be so busy. Now it's like the dentists are doing their own like wisdom teeth and like implants and stuff. So what do you see like the future of like specialists? Like, cause I think, or even to a lesser extent to be less gloomy, like a lot of specialists, like don't have their own, like practice and they kind of travel like office to office and like provide their services. Right. Um, right. Especially like in, in the city where it's like a saturation issue going on, maybe not so much like in the smaller towns, but uh, so what's like, what do you, where do you think that's going to be going in the next like five, five to 10 years? Like how specialists are going to be practicing? Well, I think, I think dentistry in general is changing. You know, there's forecasts of corporate dentistry taking over. Um, yeah. I've seen in our area and other areas, dental insurances are buying practices and then now that's crazy how they practice. Um, and you know, don't get me on my soapbox uh, about dental insurances, but (laughs) you know, there's definitely a shift. You know, I I talked to my dad and, and, and Dr. Edwards, they've been around since 1990. 
uh, practicing and they definitely see a shift, you know, on a mm-hmm. Friday in the heyday, what you call it would be, yeah. they'd be seeing 20 to 25 third molar surgeries in a single day, yeah. you know, and I look at a day now and I'm like, Oh, I have, I have eight to 15 mm-hmm. IVs, you know, yeah. this is going to be a great day. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of the, uh, I think a lot of things, the general dentist is coming out of school with a lot more debt. So yeah. they want to keep things in house. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of uh, dental gurus are saying, keep it in house. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, people want, you know, people like oral surgery. I think they like it's implants. Do, so yeah. They say, well, yeah, it, 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 it really is fun. And I, I go to lunch with guys and I try to say, Hey, you know, whatever you don't want to do, send it my way because I like to do it too. Yeah. Um, but I'm okay if someone wants to do oral surgery. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's dentistry. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have my own personal opinions. I, I've seen a lot more screw ups, you know, For sure. yeah. people being referred to us. So I think that might be a, a thing if, if, uh, if people start doing more and maybe are out of their comfort level, then they'll, they'll get lost in the woods a little bit and have to refer to the specialist. So we, we have seen a lot more of that. Um, so with that, I say, just take it easy step by step and always ask yourself would I want a new doctor experimenting this on me? Yeah. That's a good principle. (laughs) Just follow, follow the ethics of dentistry because some things I see are like, okay, I totally understand how you got lost in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's number 19. That route is a little curved and it took you some time. Just don't spend four or five hours torturing the patient in the chair. You know, know when your limit is up and Mm -hmm. refer that patient out, you know, yeah, I think um, I think I messaged you about this a while back. Um, I think you're like, you're, it was like maybe like four or five months ago. You're like in Alaska and you had some time to kill. So you like started this uh, debate about like what uh, procedures should oral, like general dentists take on and and not to take on. Like yeah. when are you causing harm to the patient? And I think I messaged you about like, so I, I'm curious because I, so if you started, say you started extraction like on a upper, upper six, um, Cause you guys, the Americans have your crazy numbering system. So I'm trying to count as you're saying like number three, <laughs> number, number three or 14. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so if you're doing that and like, uh, whatever you break like a, the mesial buckle root, if you spend like, say like half an hour and you can't get it out, like what's the safe, like what's, what's like, how would you approach it as like, if you were the specialist being, I'm sending a case to you, how would you want me to handle that? And like communicate that to the patient that I can't get this out. I need to send you to the specialist. And how would you want me to communicate that with you to make it as like, seamless as possible for the patient? Uh, and patients can understand. They're not stupid. So if you're having a hard time, I, th- I think if you're going to do something, you outline the patient all the potential possibilities. Yeah. From the very smallest thing to worst case scenario. So an upper six, as you back lands people call it <laughs> the rest of the world <laughs> yeah the rest of the world, <laughs> yeah, the the world no. we're not even on metric systems yet uh, <laughs> three or 14 to the americans listening yeah um you tell the patient okay there's proximity to the sinus i might yeah. not get all the roots uh this 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 can happen so and again it, it goes down to the time if the patient's crying you can't get them numb then well okay i've reached my limit i'm going to send you the specialist Mm-hmm. but I've, and I, we get those, we get those a lot. I'm okay with it. It's, it's the ones that make me scratch my head when the patient comes in they say, well, I've been in the chair. I was in that chair for six hours. I felt everything. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, I, and I know, I know generally people aren't trying to hurt someone. So I, yeah, I, I can see how that bit, maybe. <laughs> but then I'll, I'll get cases like that. And I, I look at them and say, well, if, if, only they would have made a little bit larger flap or removed a little bit more bone then they could have gotten access to the tooth yeah typically we can get a tooth like that in our office and you know 10 minutes later it's out yeah and then they look and go well what the heck how come we just send me here in the first place so you yeah. have to think you know is this going to be a practice builder um am i getting in over my head and a lot of times you can't tell that from the get-go and that's why you know i'm not I'm not like being prideful or saying I'm better than everyone else. Cause yeah. I, I've had my humbling teeth experiences. You know, you're like, what the heck is wrong with this dude? I just can't get it out. Yeah. I had, my, I, don't, I don't know where I heard this, but my favorite quote someone said was like, as soon as I graduated dental school and started taking teeth out in private practice, every tooth was enclosed. Like all of a sudden, yeah. like, 
<laughs> I was like, it's true. Like, I can't get what into. I like, myself into? <laughs> I like flew out of dental school, but now I'm like and, by myself. And, and it's like, <laughs> I'll have those days in private practice. I, I come in and I breathe and every tooth just, I flick my wrist, it comes out. And the next day I'm like, you know, I'm thinking I'm the man. I'm pounding my chest. Ooh, look yeah. at me. And the next day it's like crack, crack. <laughs> every crown breaks off and you have to section every tooth and yeah. you're like drilling and drilling. And you're like, oh my gosh, all this bone I've removed. And <laughs> so, yeah. And then you're, you get back and go, oh, man, that was, that was a bad day. I'm not as cool as I thought I was. Yeah. So it can be difficult. So, so if, if someone wants to do oral surgery in their practice, you know, do a lot of CE. Um, don't go, don't go to a weekend course and think you can do it all. Go to a lot of weekend courses, uh, get your fingers wet. Um, yeah. people say, well, I only do the easy cases. I don't know if there's such thing as an easy case. You know, there's things that aren't as technically difficult. So I posted a picture yesterday in my account of a tooth that took less time to remove than it took to make a post on Instagram. <laughs> And it was a floating tooth and I had lots of comments. Well, how come the dentist didn't do that? And blah, blah, yeah. blah. And it's like, well, the dentist was on vacation, you know, and this yeah. patient had seen us before. So they came into the office. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, teeth like that, super easy, but a long canine route. Just look at your approach. Mm -hmm. Have you done one of these before? How did you do it? Is it moving with the forcep? Well, don't force it. You might have to make an incision. Yeah. You might have to open up the gums a little bit. And if that intimidates you, well, shadow someone, see what they do. Uh, go to some courses, practice on a pig's head, whatever. Get is comfortable is, with uh, it. watching Instagram count? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I I, um, I feel like my training was very vast, but even on Instagram, I go, you know what? That is a really cool technique. And yeah. with our expertise as dentists and specialists, mm -hmm. we can look at that. We understand what that person is doing and say, I can yeah. incorporate that into my practice. Yeah. But I also see heart surgeries on Instagram. I go, well. <laughs> I don't have the background in that, you know, but yeah. as a dentist, we do. So we, we can understand where to make the incision, how to suture, et cetera, et cetera. So you start small and take baby steps. Yeah. So know, what, uh, what tips do you have for like safely starting to kind of expand your like comfort zone, like in, in your practice? Like, um, is it like, obviously like outside of, you can take all the courses you want, I think, but still until you like get into yourself and you're feeling that in your hands, you get the tactile feedback and, and, right. and screw up a few times. Um, like, how do you, how would you recommend for like a new grad kind of like starting to work and starting to take some teeth out um, to like safely be like, okay, um, I can take out like some perio involved teeth. Now I can like start to section some like molars and now, okay, I can start to do some like um, just like vertical impacted like thirds. And I, what do you think like that progression would be like safely to like do some cases? Well, it depends on the practitioner, depends on their comfort level. Um, and depends on, I think, how busy they are in other areas of dentistry. Yeah. Um, but, you just, yeah, it's progression, just like you said. You, you start out, what was your training like? Uh, what's your education like? You know, how skilled are you with a 15 blade? How skilled are you at removing bone without cutting into other teeth? Mm -hmm. um, you know your anatomy. And you just make make small, stepwise decisions. Yeah. I think that was, that was, that was the thing for me. Like, the learning curve for me was... And it's interesting with dentistry, like you said, like as dentists, we watch on Instagram and we're like, okay, I understand what they're doing so I can kind of try it out. Um, and I thought like, you know, your hand skills improve, like doing like cavity preps, right? So when I started like sectioning teeth a little bit, at first I'd be really nervous because I'd be like, this hand piece is like extra powerful or like I can't control it. Like, you just think it's like so different to like the same, it's like the same me like mechanics, basically like the hand, like finger rest, you know, good. You can like uh, visualize what you're doing. Um, so when I, Click, that clicked in my head that like it's just like the same thing as like cutting teeth cutting bone is not any different really in terms of like how you go about it um that made a big difference for me to like be more comfortable like sectioning teeth or like guttering around some bone um and then one of the good things for me was i worked in an emergency office um and we take a lot of teeth there because people come in in pain and i work with a prosthodontist who's like the principal dentist there so he's all about like preserving bone and stuff so uh he has like this like really like fine tip like uh Bev, like a uh, tapered diamond burst for like sectioning his teeth and he takes his time like uh so i learned a lot from him which is pretty cool and and then now i'm like okay i feel comfortable raising flaps i feel comfortable like sectioning teeth in the front of the mouth let me start to go into like do some more third cases because it's hard to see obviously hard to reach hard to access so you want right. to be comfortable with like the foundational kind of skills before you kind of get in there and and kind of get stuck and screw yourself over a little bit or screw the patient over a little bit right and then they do call it you've heard this before that the practice of dentistry so yeah. Do I place implants better today than I did three years ago at, at a residency? Yeah. 
For sure. For sure. So I, I didn't come out of residency and go, oh, look at me, I'm an implant God or I can take out every implant or a wisdom tooth. Um, so it, it, it takes time to refine skills. I think even specialists, if you're not learning and changing and growing, mm-hmm. um, then you're become stagnant and, and go downhill. Yeah. What's your, it's a bit of a controversial one. Maybe uh, what's your t- like, cause everyone's doing implants. So like there's perio doing yeah. implants, there's prostate doing implants, there's oral surgeons doing implants. Like, if you're a general dentist and you want to refer a case out for an implant placement, like what's the pros and cons or like the, uh, the checklist you got to go through to be like, okay, I'm going to refer this one out to oral surgeon. Or I'm going to refer this one out to a uh, perio. Uh, like what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think it probably just depends on the dentist. It depends on the area. Um, again, I, I always, I always tell people there are oral surgeons who are really good at placing implants and there are some that aren't. Yeah. There are periodontists who are really good at placing implants and some who aren't. There are general dentists who are good and some that aren't. Yeah. So as a general dentist, you want to find someone who's going to work well with you. I think communication is a big factor. Um, if, if I get a difficult case in my office and it just, the referral says implants on it, (laughs) you know, then, okay, well, where, you know, they're missing 12 teeth and there's a collapsed bite and great. Now I have to treatment plan this. I'm not a prosthodontist, you know? Um, so now we got to talk to the patient about it and say, well, here's good enough bone, et cetera, et cetera. So it, as a, as a general dentist referring out, you want to find someone that you can work well with, who's going to do a job uh, to your satisfaction. Um, that communicates well. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the most part, all oral surgeons do that. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it really depends on their practitioner. So I'm not going to yeah. get into that turf war of, you know, yeah, only, we're better, they're better. Yeah. Only this person or type of uh, yeah. specialty or whatever <laughs> should be placing the implants. It's, it really goes down to are, are they doing a good job and do they know what they're doing? Yeah. And uh, just for some, some clinical hacks that, cause I, I do this selfishly somewhat cause I get free C pretty much out of it and I get to talk to you guys. Um, so when you look at a pan for like third molar extractions, uh, what's like the five th- top five things that you like consider before you kind of start like in your planning process of like, okay, this angle it this way, I'm probably going to have to like section it or I'm going to have to remove bone or like, what are like those kind of things that you look at? Like, I know obviously like, it was like the winter's class, like all the classification systems out there, but I want to see like from your experience, what you look at. Well, I'm going to look at nerve proximity. Yeah. That's that's the top one. Um, the angulation of the tooth, if it's if it's vertical or mesoangular, or horizontal or distal angular. Uh, sometimes they're sideways, so you just see like on the panel a yeah, little flower like, bud, and you're like, yeah. oh, well, that's either going lingual or it's going <laughs> mesial. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to approach each tooth the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I will make a distal buckle release. I'm going to bring my incision around, if this is for a lower, around yeah. the second molar, but I won't release that uh, mesial papilla on the second molar. So it's a pretty small conservative flap. Um, if I have to, I'll release it, usually for like a deep horizontal that I need to get a little bit better visualization for. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, sometimes after you've done the flap and you know you can see the tooth, I'll take out my elevator and I'll give it a wiggle. If it wiggles out, we're good. If it doesn't, yeah. or you can look at it and go, well, it's covered by all bone or 75%, yeah. then yeah, you got to use a hand piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, again, that comes with experience because I'm not really looking at the panel going, well, I'm going to approach this tooth like this. I'm going to see what it looks like clinically. I'm going to tell the patient of the potential risks. And once that tooth is exposed, either remove bone or, or elevate okay. or section. Yeah. And, um, so, cause I, one of the things that was holding me back was like, it was taking too long. Like, I feel like I could do all the steps and I could do it safely. So I was like comfortable when I was doing it. Um, but I felt like maybe it was taking like, maybe like 30 minutes for like one and you guys are doing it like in six minutes. So I'm like, I don't know if it's like doing a disservice to the patient or if it's like We're increasing or if it's increasing like post-op complications or, or pain and symptoms and all that. Um, so I think that's like one of the things, but it's hard to get practice cause you can't just like, it's not like people are referring third molars to us or we're like just doing it like ton of it like every day. Right. Um, so that's one of the limitations too. Like if you do one a month, like you'll never be confident at it. I think you have to kind of do it more frequently to like get right. the reps in and kind of speed up and do it safer and like faster and more efficiently. Um, that's pretty cool. And thanks. So I think, yeah, I'll try that out. I mean, 
I haven't done a ton of them. I've been, I had a bad experience. Like when I first graduated, cause I was like, I, I did a lot in school. So I came out thinking like, okay, I'm like a oral surgeon. Like, let's do this. <laughs> and I had like this, like mesial impacted, like lower, uh, lower, um, like left eight, um, three eight here. I don't know what, like 20 or something for you guys. <laughs> um, either, either 19, 17 or 32, <laughs> 17. 30, 32 on the left. It goes, yeah. Yeah. So, yes. And, uh, <laughs> That's why I was talking to someone on Instagram and I was mocking the Americans and I was like, do you guys measure your like endo working length and like fractions of inches or millimeters? <laughs> millimeters come yeah. on. <laughs> um, yeah. So that I did that one and it took me like an hour and like a half and I was just like, patient was miserable. I was miserable. Like I nicked the guy's tongue with the burr. So like after that, I was like, man, I'm not doing this again. It took me like five, six months before I even like tried it again. After I did like a bunch of other extractions kind of, build up like the foundation to get from the ground up right. uh, but yeah i think yeah i want to try and do a bit more of it i just think it's fun to do um i would do oral surgery but yeah just going back to school for four years i can't i can't do it i know <laughs> i don't know how i survived yeah. or my that's, wife yeah you're, yeah that's crazy. My, my wife gets all the props yeah and yeah, actually, shout out for her. Her. And my buddy uh, who's in med school just had his first kid too so i don't know why well, you guys have to make it so much harder on yourselves as well like on top yeah. of everything <laughs> well i, I my wife and I always agreed. Uh, we thought that the wife should get a degree too at the end yeah. of residency or dental school. Yeah, they should get the credit always. <laughs> awesome. So uh, we'll do the f- uh, rapid fire stuff to end this off, and then sure. uh, we'll go live after on Instagram, and we'll have a chat on there and see what people are, uh, are up to as well. Uh, so this is pretty random. I've written it down, so it's in no uh, specific order. So the first question is uh, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Coke. Yeah. Diet Coke. <laughs> Diet Coke. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite instrument for extraction? Like spade one instrument. elevator. Spade elevator. So is that yeah. the spear shape one? That's the one. Yeah, the spear. If you've seen my Instagram, there's a yeah. couple of videos that I have highlighted that, and yeah. it's good because it pierces the bone. Mm-hmm. So like a an upper eight, as you guys call them, or one to sixteen. Yeah. If it's a full bony, that maxillary bone is pretty soft, so you make your flap, and you can mm-hmm. just wedge that in there. I don't have to remove any bone. I just wedge it between those two teeth and yeah and it pop it cool. out yeah. and i use it for the lowers too yeah yeah those are nice we have yeah we don't have the ones with like the big handles like you we have like the ones kind of like uh it's like pencil shaped but it has a spear at the end oh yeah uh, so those are nice for like finessing in there well, like, spaces if if you uh i think hugh freedy henry shine yeah uh, a titan pretty much every instrument company is going to sell the spade and that's actually probably my most asked question on instagram like, is where do i instrument is that where do i get it <laughs> Yeah, it works well. Yeah. It's a spade uh, elevator. Spade elevator. What's your uh, go to sutures? 3 0 Chromic. 3 0 Chromic's what you use. And uh, what's your favorite Instagram account that you follow? Oh, that's a tough question. My favorite Instagram account. I don't know if I have a favorite. Yeah, everyone, everyone is fantastic. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think there's a special uh, kinship with Bloody Tooth Guy. Yeah. Um, because. I started mine and like a few days later he started his and there was just this, uh, this connection on the East and West coast. And, and you guys were like early adopters. Like there wasn't many out there. Like no, when you started, I think no, it was like early no. days, right? Yeah. And we would, he would post something and I swear I was like, I was just about <laughs> to take a picture of that exact same thing. And then I would do the same thing as like, Oh my gosh. And, and, <laughs> together the uh the game elevated and yeah, yeah it's been fun interacting but there's been so many people that i've talked to on instagram uh, including yourself um that it's been it's been such a fun ride yeah no it's great it's a great community and it's nice it's nice to like have access to you guys like you have a i remember i had that uh i think it was like a couple of months back i had this like like uh pretty broken down upper eight and it's like one of the first times, like I can say first time, I think all like since I graduated, that I couldn't get it out. Like I just spent like, I spent like half an hour. It was kind of ended the day as well. It's kind of like couldn't be bothered to like raise yeah. a flap and stuff. And I, and I just couldn't get a, like a leverage because upper eights usually are like pretty, pretty cake as well. Like, right. But, and it just wouldn't move. And I tried everything and I'm like, all right, I got to stop this before I get like irreversible damage here. So, <laughs> so then I asked you and you told me about use the rongers to kind of like grab it and like pinch off like a bit of the buckle plate with it um to kind of try and like wiggle it out that way so i'll have to try it out next time for sure but uh yeah for for an eight if it's not budging was it uh erupted yeah it was fully erupted but it was like just pretty much like half of it was gone because the carries like the the okay the, uh mesial half was gone so i had no like access like no uh leverage point there so that was like the tricky part 
try that spade and i i i will often pull out my mallet and yeah. chisel and do some okay. tapping <laughs> tap tap because if you can get some leverage on that tooth yeah it'll come up that, i wouldn't just say well let's just start doing that right away you know <laughs> yeah. someone has done that before um yeah. it again takes experience so yeah for sure tap tap <laughs> <laughs> careful though yeah <laughs> Poke out to the yeah, you don't want to tap into the sinus. <laughs> Why does my eye hurt? <laughs> what's your what's your favorite sports team? Seahawks or Mariners? Yeah, I grew up loving the Sonics, and then they disappeared. And the Bulls, they never, they can never beat the Bulls back in the late nineties. Yeah, 90s, that's so. like us in Cleveland right now. Yeah. So yeah, I know the pain. <laughs> the two Seattle sports teams. Yeah. <laughs> and if you uh, like soccer, the Sounders are good out here too. Yeah, they're pretty good. We have oh, we have a lot of uh, well, Toronto like just won the MLS last year, so we have yeah. it's like our first they, time our they, city's won anything. They beat the Sounders. But, yeah, they did. That was, well, you guys beat us the year before like, undeservedly, yeah. but <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a good day. <laughs> In Toronto, you beat us too. That's huge. Good for you guys. Um, what's your uh, so if you weren't an oral surgeon or like a dentist in general, uh, what profession would you have pursued? Uh, so I follow another guy on YouTube and Instagram, Jimmy Darista. Yeah. He's got millions of followers and he builds stuff. He, he welds. He, yeah. He's a carpenter by okay. trade. Yeah. Um, or um, uh, yeah, I just like to work with my hands. Yeah. So I do something that way. Carpentry. I'm a, kind of a handyman. In my, if you see my story. I'm yeah, like, you fixed the door handle or something yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I do stuff like that. That's great. And uh, or, so what, uh, yeah. What was my other one? Uh, independently wealthy <laughs> trust fund baby yeah, i'll take it yeah. <laughs> what's your uh, favorite pizza topping pepperoni pepperoni all right that's and a hard one that's not my favorite food too no it is or it is, is it? my, it is, yeah, it is, it is my yeah. favorite food pizza so yeah yeah i'll go with pepperoni so, like it's good anytime uh so this one i think I think you're a classic one. I think you've posted some stuff about like Pink Floyd or something in the past. So between Beatles, Pink Floyd, or Zeppelin, uh, if you if you were like on a desert island, you can only take one album f- between the three bands. Like, what would you take? Pink Floyd. Yeah, which one? Well, probably a greatest hits collection <laughs> of everything. Yeah, I had I, was, I had one of those CDs. I think it was called like uh, Echoes or something. It was like a two CD greatest hits. That was yeah. a pretty good one. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Pink my favorite band of all time though is journey journey yeah, yeah. that dates me yeah it does <laughs> i just uh yeah that's not from like i just like small town girl or something is that like their uh, what's the song go it's like living in a lonely world <laughs> yeah. that's journey right <laughs> that's journey yeah the journey cover bands go to song <laughs> <laughs> that's the popular one that everyone dances to yeah yeah Awesome, man. Thanks a lot. It was great chatting with you. Uh, yeah, of course. Some good oral surgery is like so like underappreciated on Instagram. I feel like everyone's all about like veneers and cosmetics and bonding. And cosmetic and, stuff. and yeah. you know, I think endo and oral surgery are underrepresented. Yeah. For, and they're like the fun things to do. Yeah. Yeah. You Lots of periodontists. Yeah. But what I like about oral, oral surgery, like ex- extractions, exodontia in general is like, like there's an immediate, like, you know, you got it. Like if you want to finish it, it's like it's done. You don't have to like wait to see like, how is this like endo going to respond? How is this bonding going to hold up? Or like, like, okay, the problem is out. Like I fixed the infection. Like, <laughs> I, see the, I see the patient once. So I don't really have to talk to him because yeah. I put him to sleep. So <laughs> that's the, I, I need to get my, I think that's like when I see like, um, like anesthetists in general, like the happiest people I've ever met, like in healthcare, <laughs> like they have the best job. I think like things can go wrong and when they go wrong, it's pretty bad. But I think in general, like they're pretty happy people because they have <laughs> to do patients. So like everyone's asleep. Dermatologists right? are pretty happy too. Dermatologists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, like in dental school, we would uh, spend some time like in oral surgery theater, like um, like shadowing the oral surgeons. And I'd see the anesthetist, like they put the patient to sleep and they're just sitting back, like reading the newspaper or like playing like Angry Birds on their iPhone. And, like, yeah. the, surgeons, the surgeons like so, <laughs> they're like telling us, if you want to specialize, just become an anesthetist, like don't deal with this stuff. <laughs> that pretty much sums up my six months of anesthesia rotation. Yeah. Is the patient asleep? Are they stable? Perfect. Where's my material? Yeah. <laughs> my video games. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Um, so I guess I'll try and get my this pleasure. up. pleasure. Thank uh, you. We'll, we'll try and get this up pretty soon. And uh, hopefully down the line, we'll do another one and see how things are progressing and, and how things are going.